Perfect. So welcome to episode 14 of the Oso Spurs podcast, where we've got a really interesting episode. What we're going to do today is go into the fundamentals of how Enoch are, how they're set up, where does Joe Lewis fit in this, where does Daniel Levy fit in with this, and dive into the culture of Tottenham, try to get a bigger picture and a bigger understanding of the group that own our football club so that we as fans can understand perhaps where we might be able to influence change and improvements, but also where we might be wasting our energy and pointing the fingers in the wrong, wrong directions. So we've got an awesome panel. Um, we've got Sai. How are you, Sai? Hello, mate. Nice to see you again, Jim. <laughs> Good to see you. And, and anyone who doesn't know Sai, he's a senior leader in a large multinational organisation with a master's in um, change management and culture. So that's going to be a very important part of the discussion. Uh, then we've got uh, David. Hi, David. How are you? Yeah. Uh, David has a very strong experience in the, in the business world as well across multiple regions. He's been a treasurer and he's also had experience working with Daniel Levy and Caldecott. So we won't go into too much detail those specifics, specifics for obvious reasons, but he'll be able to give us a good insight into the, you know, the culture inside Tottenham and what it's like working with individuals. And we've also got Luke. How are you, Luke? Hey. How's everyone? Good to hear from you. Doing well, thank you. And Luke, you hold a master's, an MBA, sorry, I don't want to do any disservice, in, was it business and administration? So we're looking forward to hearing your opinions as well on the structure of, of the club. Yeah. So if it works for everyone, David, can we start with you and just understanding a bit in your words of like, who are Enoch and where does Levy, Lewis and that club of people fit into into the group yeah sure well you know as, as, I, as you said earlier we, we had some connection with them through the trust prior prior to that i was very aware of what was going on with the club <clears throat> from from mr sugar's days you know we we tried in those days to have dialogue with sugar who as you're probably aware wasn't very open to talking to fan groups and that sort of thing so when Levy took over. One of the things Levy wanted to do was to open it up, and make fans more inclusive into the whole process. Hence, the trust got some got some leverage. You know, so I joined the trust. I was in the trust right from the start. I sought election, got on the board about two thousand and five. The reverse, two thousand four, two thousand five. By the time Joel was there, I think um, we just had a spell with uh, um, David Fleet being semi charged I think after Hoddle got sacked. So it's around about. Run out of that era, you know. And um, that was interesting. We, we had quite a good dialogue with the club at the time. Um, and from what we could see was that the, the, the club, the, the leader was very much run by uh, Levy, Collicott, and, and Donna Cullen. They're very, very close. It's always meetings with them and one or two underlings, you know. They seem to be very much representing the club. So to our knowledge at the time, um, Lena, because you're probably aware, the English National Investment Company, were, I think they owned about five or six, or shares in five or six clubs, including Rangers, the Greek, the Greek club, I, I should have written it was down, but I had all the list of clubs. But they, had, they, they were building a portfolio, a bit like a lot of the clubs are now doing, ironically. You know, Man City, the, the, you know, the, 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 um, the groups are, are building teams from all around the world now. That's going to be quite common. You know, Newcastle are going to do the same thing, I think, their owners. So you know, we were probably ahead of the game in those days, but they're not heavy players, let's be honest. They were just investing small amounts, 10% here, 20% there, you know. And then they can stumble across to buying a, what, a third of the club from Sugar, I think it was, in the end, they got. Not, not the whole thing. But through for a, a series of rights issues, which the trust did invest in, we did invest in some of those rights issues, the club took more and more of the share of the, club, uh, of the pie, as it were, the... The Enoch took more and more share of the pies who were to where they are now, I think about 86% today, aren't they? Something like that. So in terms of Enoch itself, um, as far as I'm, I'm aware and the search I've done, they are pretty much owned almost exclusively by Joe Lewis and Daniel Levy. Pretty much the two of them own the whole thing. Um, they divested from all those clubs they were invested in. And they put, put all their eggs in the, in the Tottenham basket, basically, some years ago. So that's where they're in a car right now. They more or less are the controlling interest of Tottenham Hotspur. 
that's pretty common knowledge. And, that, many... and from your experience, you know, working with the club in different roles, how much, where does the, who are the key influencers in this realm? You mentioned Caldecott, Levy, Lewis, but I think <clears> whenever <throat> something happens, it's the default now for Daniel Levy's face to be the graphic associated to every single major decision the club makes, because he's obviously perceived as the guy who's running the, the, the show from the football perspective, making yeah. he's the, the buck stops of him. Is that a right yeah, assessment yeah. for fans to make? I would say that's right. And that's always been the case. I mean, the one thing that's been for me, having been involved in the very early days was that it really, the, the, the entity that runs the club has not, not hasn't changed very much. The, the core entity, I should say, the, the, that core of, of the directors that I mentioned earlier, they are still there, you know. Um, my impression of them was that they they didn't really seek publicity. They're, they're very media sh uh, shy. They, even, um, you know, um, uh, Levy, Levy's not, he's a very quiet, shy man. But I must have met him about, you know, six or seven times, something like that. He's very, very quiet, very unassuming. You know, he doesn't say very much. He, he answers questions. He doesn't give much away. He's very, it's a very uh, coy operator, shall we say? Um, Matthew Collicott, he is someone who keeps himself very back in the shadows. You, you probably know the name. You probably wouldn't even know what he looked like. If you know, if I hadn't met him a few times, I wouldn't know what he looked like either. You know. And Don McCullum, she's supposed to be head of PR, whatever. But it's a director now. She wasn't then, I don't think. But she's director now. But she would think, I'd think, be the more high profile person, but she keeps very much in the background as well. So you heard that um, a while ago that uh, Conte was complaining that he's always the one that goes up front in front of the press, you know. And I could fully understand that because that, that's what they do. They don't put any of themselves up, up in front of the press to talk to anybody. Even Paratici was uh, rolled out the other night, as we know, the day before he was suspended by FIFA, you know, and that was almost like he had the arm. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like he had the arm up his back, didn't it? To sort of like, well, somebody's got to talk to the fans, you know. The season tickets are coming up for renewal, sort of thing, you know. So, um, they could, so in, in the culture, uh, looking at it as a corporation, if you like, the culture is a very, very, well, it's quite a high profile business. They're very, very withdrawn. They don't, put, and I think they fear, I think they fear publicity. You know, they don't like being in the, in the, in the limelight, really. You know, they're not happy about it at all. And at the time I was involved, it was, it was quite a lot of bad feeling from the fans towards Enoch. Even then, we're talking probably after Hoddle had been there. I don't even recall. If I was there the day that they were people were throwing a big gesture, but throwing their empty season ticket books onto the pitch when we got beaten by Blackburn in the last home game of the season. Then Hoddle went very early the next season, you may recall. And at that time, Levy was getting verbal. I was in the West End. Levy is getting verbal abuse from fans, which he hates, mm. absolutely hates. It, you know? Does, and this is another question to someone who's met him, right? Mm. Does he, and it, no worries if you don't know for sure, but there's there's a big argument over, online whether does Levy actually have any interest at all in, you know, Tottenham winning? Like from an emotional perspective, does he, does he actually support Tottenham? Because some people say he used to go to games prior to being a part of Enoch, and some people say that's just obviously a PR spin. But we've established so far he does call the shots, so he is the one who's being rightly being held accountable for all the mistakes currently in many respects. Um, but does... does so you're saying is he, the, what, what's the... In terms of the scales, which which way does it tip? Fandom or, or the business side of it, you know? Well, that's, yeah, because... Experience would be, yeah, go on, use yeah, it. I, don't, I think it's definitely the business. He clicked... He claimed to be, and I did have a couple of chats about this, he did claim that he was a fan, although the rumour was he had a season ticket at Arsenal. I don't know if you heard that rumour, but before he took over at Tottenham, he had a season ticket at Arsenal. But as conjecture, I don't know that's a rumour that's going around at the time. But he claims his family have all been Spurs supporters. Joe Lewis is, apparently, a Spurs supporter. Um, but I think, as I always say to people, the clue is in the name, Enoch. English National Investment Company. They only saw Spurs as a, a great little opportunity to do some investment. And the reason they're not pumping their own money in, I mean, by Uncle Joe's money or anybody else's money, um, is because that's the investment. They're not taking money out. 
which people can't do criticise them for, but they're not. They're leaving it all in there. Where their, their big payday is going to be one day when they sell the plan. Mm. So they invested. Yeah, what is their exit strategy then? So, if that's the end game for them, what yeah. what, is you, what are your your thoughts around timelines, and what should we be looking out for when they're starting to initiate that exit strategy? I would have thought, had that been their their aim, they might well have been on the verge of doing it right now. And I say that because if we look at the process at Manchester United right now, where they basically put themselves up in the shop window. There's, to, well, by all reports, about eight different investment groups interested, mm. and all aren't being scared away by valuations of six billion, are they? So, I'm sure certain members of our hierarchy are rubbing their hands in glee with that if they were thinking of selling it now. So, I, I do wonder if, I mean, so, Enix shares in Tottenham, the whole Enix package is wrapped up in a trust with with John Lewis's family. I don't know if you know that works. No. So basically, I don't think Lewis, Lewis doesn't need the money. You know, he's on the Forbes list. He's got plenty of cash. I mean, I say plenty of cash with lots of investments. He doesn't, I don't think he has, what people always get wrong. They think Lewis is sitting with piles and piles of pound notes around him. He hasn't. It's all investments. You know, he'd have to divest to, to invest more in Tottenham. Even the, uh, the 150 million they borrowed, they pumped in was a, was a loan to Enoch. Well, not to Tottenham, but to Enoch. So Enoch had to pay that back. So it's not as if Uncle Joe's got 150 million you can just put into the club like Abramovich used to. Do you understand? It's a different, it's a different model, really. So not, they're not risking, aside from the initial investment they made and a couple of rights issues they did back in the, about 15, 20 years ago, they've not really put much more money in themselves than, than that that's, they've that's done through their investments. That's really interesting then. So then yeah. I, I start to think then, so if you look at the behaviours over the last couple of managers, did they get to the point where they're thinking about what's our exit strategy? And if we can get some silverware in the, in, in the cupboard, that's actually going to add some value to, to, the, to the asset that we're trying to sell. Well, okay, class, I'll turn that on you. What do you think would have more value to the club? A couple of league tin pots or a stadium that is going to be sold out yeah, to yeah. Lady Gaga yeah. and, you know, Beyonce. And that's that's where the investment has mm. been, to yeah. be honest. And, and I don't get too emotional long game. about all that. Yeah, I don't hmm? get too emotional about all that stuff, actually. About no, I don't. No, stuff. it's all going into the club. Well, this is a next question for you. I before you move on to this one, side. Si, sorry to interrupt you. But no, this is a really I'm important... I going to ask the same question. <laughs> <laughs> we need to, cause, and Luke, you might have input to this as well. Um, I think you were looking at the finance of the club. But David and Luke, like, there's a, also, so we've established so far, like, Levy does have majority of control on football decisions. So if people are angry of decisions. It's fair enough. You are pointing the finger in the right direction if you disagree of those decisions. And whether you disagree or not is on you. This isn't an Enoch out or Enoch in conversation. This is just a factual overview of a conversation. Um, we've also established that there isn't hundreds of millions of pounds in cash in our owners and chairman's bank accounts that can just be pumped into the football club overnight. So unfortunately that is just a reality of the club structure we have. We don't have that as an option for us, not to say we can't do more and they couldn't borrow more money or release equity another way. Fine. That's a different discussion. But are these, another thing is these extra revenue streams are often accused of not going back into the club. I've seen people saying they're going to offshore Bahamas bank accounts or they're going in to fund new initiatives that are outside and away from football. Do either of you have any factual view on whether that is true or not? Um, I can tip in there what I know. Are you, can you, sorry, you're very quiet. Are you there? Yeah, I am. I, for some reason, we can't get my microphone working well. Is this any better? Okay. I can hear you. Just yeah, keep talking loud. We can we can just about make it out. Yeah, fair enough. So <laughs> I'm actually looking at the 2022 end of year report. This is published on the club's official website. Um, I believe it is legally required. Um, I know in the U.S. this would be considered a legally required disclosure for publicly traded companies. I don't know, you know, the relevant U.K. laws that would force Spurs to do the same thing. But I, they've got it published here. It's on the website. And, you know, it is a little hard to read at times. It takes maybe some, some training, some qualification to, you know, make meaning out of these numbers. 
but I don't see anything that suggests that Enoch or anyone else are extracting value out of the club proper. <clears throat> so what okay, you, so I don't, you know, I, I don't okay, see anything. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I don't see any line items for you know expensive where expenses where the club might be paying some shady uh, um, consultation, yeah, right? Yeah. That sort of thing, right? Yeah. That's a great way to move money out of an asset if you own a company. Um, well, I don't I see any like that. Yeah. That's what I know as a shareholder. We don't get dividends, so clearly they're not paying themselves for being the majority shareholder. Easiest way would be to pay dividends from the put, but they're not making a profit. They have certainly didn't make a profit last year. But and they haven't actually on, made profits over the years, particularly, as we know. Well, there's, so, there's on this note, there is another specific allegation on that topic from fans. I just want to make sure we clarify this topic fully. People are saying that they're investing it all in property. Hmm. And there's, there's evidence on the balance sheet of some investments into property, and people are saying that. Is, is there evidence that there's money funneling into this property empire that people are saying? I have no idea personally. <laughs> That's why I'm asking both of you. Well, you have to understand that the, the Tottenham, the THSC, the company THSC, own property because they, I don't know if you know, but um, probably about 10 years more than that year now, there was a certain gentleman as a director of the company whose role really was to buy up all the properties around the, White Hart, the old White Hart Main Stadium. You can appreciate that. A guy called Paul Kemsley. And he was his main role was to purchase. He's a property dealer. You know, can't say anything more about him, but I have met him. Um, and he, his, his, uh, his, his job was to buy up all the properties. Now, you may recall going back to the old White Hart Lane, there's a big sort of industrial area north of the ground. There's a petrol station. There was all those properties around the ground. They purchased one by one. You may recall they used the petrol station as a Spurs store for a while and while they were getting planning commission, all that sort of thing. So they, they were buying up land all around the ground. But some of it was going under the Tottenham package, Tottenham Hotspur Football Club package, to build the stadium. Some of it was further away, you know, down by White Hart Lane, the, the railway near the railway line, they bought a big bit of land there where they're using for storage, all the materials that are being brought to the stadium. That's one of the areas they're, built, they're going to be building properties on. But to my knowledge, that's under another company, right. not, not Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. So if you look at the structure of, of um, how they funded everything, there's a lot of offshore stuff going on. And, and, I, and I agree with Luke. I, when I've looked at, the, looked at books, I can't see them funneling money into those companies anywhere. It does, it does seem to be everything's going into the club. I, to my knowledge, some of those offshore, some of those companies are offshore, and I believe Matthew Collicott and Daniel Levy are, are, are directors of those companies, but they're separate away from Tottenham. And you they're not funded the, through. And what you're saying is that they are not, the, rep, the money is not going from Tottenham from the club, into these no, offshore bank no, accounts. No, it's not the have, money that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Luke, Luke's obviously studied the, the, the books as well. And it's, they're not hiding anything. It's not. I mean, the way, as he said, the way that they, I thought they might be doing it is through. And I looked for this, having these these sort of consultancies, like you know, we we're consulting on how to get beers through the bottom of the glass, and that's three million a year. Thank you very much. Sort of that sort of stuff. You know, there doesn't seem yeah. to be anything like that going on. Have you, have you not seen that, Luke? Yeah. So I think one thing that people might be kind of catching on to is um, I'm looking at page 17 of the most recent uh, 2022 year-end report, and there is a note in the cash flow statement. Um, there's a section on cash flows from investing activities. And something that might catch somebody's eye is $32 million spent in acquisitions of property, plant, and equipment. Um, and I think what happens is people see acquisitions of property and they think, oh, my good grief, Spurs are spending 32 million pounds on, you know, on property. They're buying up land or buildings or something that has nothing to do with the football club. And that's not really what that means, right? Property, plant, and equipment is very much a, a defined accounting term um, yeah. that refers to, you know, all sorts of things. Um, you know, not players in our case, that's a separate line item, 
Um, but it could be things like, you know, supplies for those bottoms up beers and things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, that's all it, kind of falls under a much larger umbrella of property, plant, and equipment. But there are, and there are, the, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I've got to say, there are still, even though the stadium's finished, there are things going on within the stadium all the time. They're, you know, improving things. They're talking about building a hotel, aren't they, in the yeah. um, main end. There's that um, medical center in the north northeast corner, which would be under the auspices of the stadium. And that's why a lot of houses to do that, I recall. That sort of stuff can go in there. But as far as the, the land that, 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 that they're talking about building on, and that's land opposite the stadium, um, between the station and the stadium, White Hart Lane Station and the stadium, they've already bought that. That's a previous, or not they already bought, that's another entity that owns that. And there's nothing so, going on with that at the moment. They're not, they've got, I think they've got planning permission now, haven't they? To start doing things with that, but that's another entity. And I, again, I've not seen any funding going from the books of Spurs into these entities. I think there's about 30 different companies associated with all this. I mean, it's a quite a complex. Yeah. And sorry, Sai, to keep interrupting you. I really want you to ask the next question, but I just wanted to quickly finish this thread off before I, just in case we change direction, because we had questions. You know the Cheese Room podcast? Um, it's a really nice podcast. If anyone hasn't listened to it, go check them out. Um, but David Harris from from there, he's been digging into the statements as well, and, and you wanted to use this opportunity to ask some questions. So we've answered some of it. He asked, the recent uh, accounts show a group of different companies essentially asking us, to explain the ones around property development and if that if our funding's going into that. But the other one was thoughts on the investment club in Vivo Power. Accounts published on club website don't list Vivo Power under investments in financial assets section. The drop in the value of the club's investment is detailed on version listed on company's house. Vivo Powered is owned by Arowana, to whom Cullen's son, Alexander Asim, is an investment director. So I'm not sure if that yeah. made any sense to, to anyone, but is that something? Well, I know that... they bought shares in that company, didn't they? They bought shares in that company. It was supposed to be it's like part of the green agenda at the club, wasn't it? Um, and the reason that the, the, apparently the shares have dropped in value, which of course happens whenever you buy shares in any company, let's be honest. Um, but yeah, there was a sort of dubious link with Conor, uh, Conor Cullen's son being involved in that company. I did. I did read about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's nothing particularly suspicious. There's not significant no, amounts of money disappearing uh, to the area. And, no, but yeah. the, the money that was lost is because the shares dropped in value, as far as I'm aware. Mm. I don't think it's just Cullen's, not a Cullen's son run off to Barbados with it or something. It's, it's just as you do with investments. They go up and they go down, as they say. And that's, yeah. thing, that's what that was, isn't it? And Sai, sorry to interrupt you oh, earlier. Go on, mate. I was, I was sort of maybe a bit of a naive question because I'm, I come from an HR background, so it's probably the other end of the scale of finance. <laughs> so it's, I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying to get, get into my head is, if, um, as we've discussed, the, 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 the Enic thing is an investment arm, or you know, so it's, it's Levy and, and Lewis investing to maximise the return from the club. I don't quite understand why people think that they would start siphoning stuff off to devalue the club, because surely there's more worth for them to get from the inflation of the value of the club than there is to siphon it off elsewhere, unless there's something else going on over there that we have no idea about. Well, you could say that in a certain way, Levy is siphoning some of it off. He's paying himself six million a year, right? You could argue that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, 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 that's like nothing illegal. I don't think anything illegal is going on here, by the way. I'm not yeah, yeah. a couple of it. But I, I think that's his way of getting his immediate yeah. reward. I don't think Lewis is worried about making three billion out of Spurs, but I think he's, he's, you know, he's in his 80s, probably not that late 80s, yeah. whatever age he is. He's probably not bothered about that, you know. This yeah. is part of his portfolio, really, isn't it? And he's even talking- remembered that if, if Levy was, if, if they did sell, Levy would still want to be. Be involved in the club if you heard that story going around you know so for Levy I think it's just purely that he likes the position and he likes the, obviously the rewards that go with it as well as having a nice big investment you know talking about Levy's 
remuneration uh, yesterday a little bit. And um, yeah. when we were talking about, you know, five, six million, and it's like people are up in arms about that. I'm like, well, I work for a corporation where we pay our CEO north of 12. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's there's, there's, it's and that's sort of standard for it. Well, I, I don't I want to pause. Yeah. I don't want with people the listening the to this company. and making it. I don't yes. want to come across that like yeah. we're defending Levy here. Just to interrupt. Sorry no, no, to interrupt. No, no, no. Like, just, like I, I get that. Okay. I think their their view is pay is based on performance, and seeing him give himself a half million pound pay rise during a time the club on the pitch is regressing, winds people up and makes them feel very frustrated and lash out. Just adding that point, but carrying on yeah, that conversation. And I can understand what? that. I completely understand that. There's another football um, CEO of a, another London club, you know, that gets about half of what Levy gets. Do you know who that is? Right. Any ideas? Do you know who that would be? A certain uh, CEO no. over at Crystal Palace. Uh, Mr. Parrish. Yeah. He's on uh, three million a year. All right. And he hasn't got a big expensive stadium with uh, various superstars playing at it. And all the other revenues come from that. It's just a football club who are mid-table at best, you know. Yeah, yeah. So how well, do you yeah. how do you evaluate it? You know how do you judge it? You know exactly. And if you look at if you look at other businesses that are around the same turnover as Tottenham in the city, their yeah. their their leaders will be on multi million <coughs> packages as well. So let's, let's, let's let's agree. This isn't cash into his pocket necessarily either. It's op- it's options. It shares. It's it's all of those stuff that goes around it. That the and the performance. And this is. And again, I'm not a Levy defender, but I just want some balance here that performance isn't just results on the pitch. It's performance for the business. And he doesn't just decide what the performance criteria will be. It has to get signed off at an Enoch board level. It has to be decided there. And and then there there must be some sort of uh, remuneration committee that decides whether he gets paid out or not. The board will decide. The board will will vote on them. Levy can't just say, oh, I fancy playing myself and that I give myself a half a, half a million pay rise. Right? Yeah. But this but is an important point I would pause check, on there because a lot of people want a change in chair, in the chairman. They want a change in Levy because his decision-making has not warranted what he pays himself. And he's not a football man. Don't believe, he's, he's, not a football he's not a football man. man. I think that's people's there issue. And we can go. all, we can talk about this and we're going to move into it a bit. There's sides he's done well on, but he has not done well on the football side. He's not a football man, like you say. I've said all along that we should, what, where, what Spurs have gone wrong, in my opinion, is Levy should have been running the, if you like, the corporate side of the club, the stadium, all the events, you know, all that side of it, the, 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 the marketing, the sponsorship, all that stuff. Naming rights, whatever happened to those. Um, whereas they need, and I hope it would be paratissue, that we'd just be left to get on with the football side, the football man, you know. He's not had that. I mean, I, in my early days at the Trust, when we used to go for meetings, David Pleat would be there sometimes. And right. he'd be always talking to, to Levy in his ear He'd be talking to him all the time. Now, David Pleat is a football man. I don't know if that relationship's still there now, but it certainly was around about the time I was involved and in going into meetings with them. Well, he was there sometimes. Well, why this is important, and I'm sorry, I just want to stop because a lot of people listen to this podcast because they, they're part of these change movement groups and they want to see a change. <clears throat> so you are right to focus on Levy by the sounds of things as the person. But ultimately, he is employed by the board. He is not employing himself, giving himself his decided mm-hmm. salary and setting his own targets. Mm-hmm. If you want to start targeting a change motion that asks for specific things, Challenge Enoch to change the way in which they compensate D- Daniel Levy. Make it more focused about results on the pitch. Demand that he isn't paid solely on revenue growth. You know, I'm, what I'm saying, I don't know if this is the right way specifically. What I'm trying to say is yeah. don't just call the guy a bald idiot because that's not going to enforce change because he's not ultimately his own boss. There are people who are voting on him and investing in him and targeting him with certain KPIs that don't align purely with success on the pitch. So I just wanted to kind of add that in for some context. But I mean, I think if, I mean, I've been in business, Luke, we all have, I think, and we all understand the difference between running a business and, and a football club is a unique, it's a unique thing, isn't it? It's a business, yeah. well, these days, more so than maybe 30 years ago, it's a business now. It's not, and then even, I noticed the other day, they let slip, they, they were calling us customers in an in a email about something, I just, I don't know if you saw that. So we, that's how they see us, not supporters. It's a different world now. 
I'm afraid. It's a fact of life, you know. Um, well, is, and the, the is trend this, are very is, different now, you know. Is this case, okay, so this is the other point, Side, we discussed this, right? We need to clarify, is this a unique problem for Tottenham Hotspur and our supporters? We wanted to compare a bit about, because we obviously can't compare ourselves to Man City, because for them, they are bought for an ulterior governmental uh, purpose, and therefore, visibility and progress on the pitch is all that matters, and they don't care about making a profit, essentially. So we can't compare to them, but perhaps we could compare to Liverpool and Arsenal, who have had and are having, you know, slightly better years than us at the moment. Um, like, where do we fit in terms of what, what should our expectation be to be realistic in terms of how I run? Are we, you know, investing what we should be into players and the pitch based on all this uh, and all that? I think, I think, as I see it, the, the club will invest. I mean, they are starting to invest as, as the revenue from the stadium starts yeah. to, to come in. You've seen in the last two or three windows, we've actually had quite good windows. It, not as good as saying maybe Chelsea or whatever, but certainly in terms of where we've been in the past, when actually give Paratici his, his due, we were getting more good players than duds, whereas before we were getting a lot more duds than good players, right? So I think we are starting to see an improvement on that side of things. But with us, because of the model we have, it has to be all self-financed. Even Liverpool and Arsenal, they're, they're part of bigger groups. And... and um, the owners of those clubs, American owners of those clubs, will put more money in, whereas we, from their other revenues, you know, because they're part of a bigger group, aren't they? You know, if you look at the way Arsenal's set up, it's part of that big group of American sports ventures as well, which, and money's been fed in. So I think early days of the ownership of Arsenal, they were feeding a lot of money into the, the um, American football team, weren't they? Then into Arsenal, because it all goes into the same pot. Then we've got, we've got a smaller pot, I guess. Mm. Um, Liverpool's much the same thing, isn't it? But even they're struggling a bit now. Even they're finding it tough. You know, Arsenal have done a. a and I'll always say this: Arsenal have nicked our idea of what, what we did with um, uh, what we did with Pochettino. You know, it's a it's a bit and, yeah, exactly. They nicked our idea and made it work by continuously investing. Those three windows we didn't invest in, we're still paying the price for that. But that was down to the stadium. You know, we. we I, 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 I'm sort of sitting in the middle here, looking at both sides of the argument. I can really understand why fans. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I've been around long enough that in my lifetime, Tottenham have won so many trophies. But half of my lifetime, and then the second half of my lifetime, we won two. This is what people are upset about. They don't care who runs the club or how they run it. Or they just worry about what's on the pitch, you know. And um, whereas Levy understands that, and pretty certainly understands that. That's why he keeps getting these win now managers in. Because he knows that's what's been lacking, you know. Yeah. And he's invested heavily in that. Don't forget. I mean, probably wasted about fifty million since Potashino left on on uh, managers and things. So, is whether I think we and I think uh, uh, Ponte said it a lot that we've got to be patient. I think we do have to be a bit patient. Levy and Enoch are going nowhere. Guarantee it. Going nowhere. <clears throat> we've got to be patient. We've got to wait for our model to start bringing in the fruit. But is it fair okay. that we could? focus efforts and this is in a, in a kind of what we can do to influence things as fans is it fair that we should have some clear asks around changing the club structure if we're stuck with enic like we want to see someone replace daniel levy in terms of leading the football side of the club we're not saying yeah. rather than pointing yeah. fingers at him and calling him an idiot because he's not an idiot yeah. he's just not no. good at making football, <coughs> football man. we yeah, should exactly. be saying we want a change in structure we don't want you associated mm. with choosing our next manager anymore daniel we want you doing your concerts and finding money, ways to get more money into the club. Yeah. We want you to be out of the wonder, picture when it comes to I football decisions. Whether, I wonder whether, though, and, and David, maybe you can have a view on this. I wonder whether Levy wants to see himself as that football man. Does he have I think a desire? He does his ego want, 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 want him to be the, the football guy? I think my reading of him as a person, I think, way back, was when he was fairly, still fairly new to the top of the thing, was that, I think he loved it, you know, mixing all these yeah. footballers and, yeah. you know, I think, but I think now he's probably a bit jaundiced with it all, you know, uh, doing all these spoiled brat footballers and agents and, you know, that's why he's got Paratici and let's be honest. Yeah. My, my yeah. feeling with him is that he, even though he's got Paratici and he won't give him complete control of the football side because even I think in the last transfer window, didn't he take over the, the Spence transfer, didn't he? It, it, it was thought that, He's going to sort the Spence one out himself, sort of thing, you know. 
And um, yeah. they didn't leave it to the Paris Solution, did he? So I don't think uh, he's part of the way out in the football side, but I don't, he's still got, you know. This is it with Daniel. I know. can't help but feel, and this is just a cultural observation from a fan, right? He mm. can't do a di- he can't do business unless he feels like he's won. Like he has to always feel he's had an influence on something. Like he every season he has to have bought a player. He has to feel like he might have bought the next Gareth Bale, gone around the manager, mm. and you remember when he bought Pochettino Sissoko as a Christmas present. You know, just as always, he <laughs> he steps away, but he can I never really, really remove see, himself from the picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was an open next Christmas, Christmas present. Wasn't it? <laughs> There goes the motto, don't yeah. throw away the suits, guys, you know. But I um, think that's where people get angry because they're just like, just yeah. back off. You get your director of football and you say you're in control and then the manager's complaining you're signing players I think for people it. are angry that we didn't get more um, jelly alleys, you know. We, we had Grealish there. Mm. We had a number of players that we could have got. Uh, Harry Redknapp was saying the other day, wasn't he, with a few players that he was interested in that Levy wouldn't go yeah. the full hog. No, the been a number of players just, like that. He, he was he gets stubborn over a point. Yeah, and, yeah. And he, he so won't it for like five million in the cut of t-shirts, didn't we, or something? Yeah. And so then the next was, uh, week they get taken over. The money's there. Then they, they, yeah. there's no need to sell him, and yeah. we've missed the opportunity. They thought he'd learned that lesson by now. You know, for a sake of a few million, when Grealish went for a hundred million. You know. Oh well, he just can't help it, can he? He has can't to feel like he's no, won. No. You could. No. If, if someone offers him something worth a pound for 50p, he won't take it. He'll want, he want to pay 40p. Like, yeah. he just can't. Yeah, yeah. He can't well, take he was the, uh, and, At he uni, was the, wasn't he the buyer yeah. for Mr. Byright or something? Uh, yeah. That's what I, you know, Mr. Byright, the old chain closed. <laughs> so he I thought mean, he was this, a, you know, he's buying up hundreds of clothes or whatever he was buying in those days. He, yeah, you can see a deal, you know what I mean? But, he always yeah, can. And, and fine, on there. the flip side, He's pulled off some master strokes, right? Like, I don't buy, and this is just, okay, I don't want to give an opinion, actually. But is it fair to say, from the <laughs> panel's view, over 20 years, if you judged how the club has moved in terms of how much money it can spend, how big the brand is, it has improved versus the average 20 clubs in the league as a position. Oh, it, oh it's no. incredible what he's achieved, let's be honest. It may might be popular view. But what they've achieved, you go, you wind the clock back 20 years when we first came in or whenever it was, you know, uh, chalk and cheese, right? So I yeah. shouldn't say cheese. But, you know, they're, they're uh, <laughs> chalk and cheese and the fabulous what we've achieved at stadium. Is everybody raves about it. It's wonderful, blah, 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 blah. And the fans were, uh, loved it for the first year or two, you know. Of course, now it's all it's four years now and we're all getting a bit, oh, okay. Now we want to see success on the pitch again because that's the nature of football supporters. No? Yeah. And three of, our really biggest four, three of our biggest four ever transfer <clears throat> windows have been the last three seasons. So like, yeah. there's no yeah. denying that since the stadium's opened, yeah. he's cocked up plenty of times and deserves lots and lots of criticism. You know, not pulling the triggers at certain points where we just needed that last yeah. push. Could have got, we could have got a million for, for um, Alley, couldn't we, at one point? And, uh, exactly. You know, Full command control over areas he doesn't have expertise in. Not trusting and delegating. Ex- exactly. I'll give you a good example. But, when I was involved in the trust, um, there was I, I went in on my own to talk to them because we used to get called in to talk about the season big ticket packages and to be think this was a good idea, that was a good idea. And nobody else was available. I went on my own to this particular chat with Collie Cotton, one of his underlings. And they were talking about re- removing the two cup um, vouchers from the season's wicket book. And it was like mid-2000, mid something like that. And I said, oh, that would be an uproar. You know, and we were not doing great at the time, you know. And I said, that was just, they just didn't see it. They just saw it as another way of getting revenue. I said, well, look, those two cup vouchers are only going to be League Cup matches anyway. And it was something, oh, I don't know. I agree. If, if Levy pulls the trigger, team, okay, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. I, I made them understand that they'd end up with um, I don't know, 5,000 for a pretty average uh, third round you know, League Cup, um, which, if they didn't have it as a season ticket um, yeah. voucher, um, and in addition to that, wouldn't make much money out of it anyway, and in addition to that, if they're selling tickets, they would the bad will they would cause by getting rid of those two cup vouchers um, in the book would be mm. would cause the problems. Now, this is in the days where there wasn't social media, there wasn't you know any anywhere way that Levy was getting beat about the head on 
all the time. He, he was getting some verbal in the stadium. That's the only time he was getting any real criticism, right? So I said, you're, gonna, you're just going to – if those things are great, you can get away with this sort of stuff. But when, it not, yeah. when things aren't going great, and it's just after you've been throwing scene tickets, scene tickets on the pitch and everything, I said, that is going to go down like a lead balloon. You know? Anyway, I persuaded them not to do it. And I was interested to see when they brought out the new season tickets for the new stadium, cut down, she said, gone, right? Because they saw, oh, new stadium, and they oh, new stadium, you know, they're not worried about the cut down, she said, anymore. They've all gone, haven't they? So, I mean, uh, but they've been there for okay. 15 years, you know, so that's some success in that regard. But, uh, do, but do you, what do you and Luke make of the of the situation if they hike the season tickets by the rumoured 11%? <laughs> like, I know you said Ian <laughs> aren't going anywhere, but oh surely, surely that's going to cause a fan revolt to the scale that Levy, that, 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 that Levy's boss, the board are essentially looking at Daniel Levy and thinking, do we need to pull a change here? If that's Stevie's decision, do you think he's at all at risk, or do you think? Well, one problem with that thing you keep saying about the board, the, uh, being support and board, blah blah blah. Got to remember, Levy's about a thirty percent shareholder in Enic, so yeah. there's nobody got controlling interest of Enic. I don't know if the how the, the board is set up that they all have a vote and it's got to go in the majority or something. But I suspect that won't be the case. It'll be on who owns the most shares. So I don't think Levy's going to sack himself somehow. So he That's does a have point. a level of control whereby oh, yeah, he yeah. is yeah. very, very hard to remove, even if he, no matter how, what performance he's got control in, of essentially. Enoch, have they? I mean, um, I think. Well, so he's the biggest shareholder in Enoch. He's, uh, um, I think Lewis is the biggest shareholder, but he's got a. But he's I mean, 89 year old Lewis isn't going to vote him out, as you yeah. said. Actually, he can't can anyway. we discuss this bit? David, how did Lewis and Levy become acquaintances? Because you know the story, right? Like, what's the well, connection? As far as I understand it, uh, Louis, Levy was friends with, best mates with um, Joe Lewis's son when they were at Cambridge together. And his the name they used for Joe Lewis was Uncle Joe. And it, you hear some fans still referring to that as Uncle Joe. So that's where the protection came about, as I understand it. So it was through a I, family connection, really. I'd heard and some they weird... Like, being a bit of a, you know, I'd heard some weird Hunger Games style... <laughs> uh, competition that Lewis had set that apparently he said <laughs> to Levy and a few others, here's a few million quid, go off yeah. and invest it, and whoever does the best gets yeah. you know, the big job. That could have been it, yeah. It could like, like a, a, a Craigslist thing, ironically, yeah? Yeah. yeah. You, think, you think Joe Lewis was the free sugar, yeah? <laughs> yeah. So, well, be it, it is really interesting, because I think you've highlighted something now that people just want to understand. Is Levy essentially his own boss? And although he's not setting his own targets, it kind of is very, very hard to remove. So yeah. in a sense, he probably does feel horribly secure. Like, he Impossible. probably doesn't feel the pressure he should feel to deliver his arrogant. arrogance and change. I think he's an arrogant yeah. person anyway. I just think he's arrogant. Yeah. He's got a little man so, complex. He's a little arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> he's only yeah. about... Uh, he's about, about for me on here. You know, he's a really, really small little guy. So he's, he's got this... You know, for yeah, some reason, I picture him having an office where he's got this, like, king's throne, which makes him feel about 12 yeah. foot tall. And you come in and sit on a little stool at the end, <laughs> hunched down under him. A little and bit just, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you want? Like, yeah, kind exactly. of thing. I just... Yeah. And his son, I, honestly, yeah, yeah. why does his son always look so miserable? <laughs> he's sat next to him on the stage. His son just looks like a well, broken He's going to inherit all this. He's going to inherit all this one, doesn't he? <laughs> so, um, so, Jim, <laughs> I, did, I did want to bring one thing. Oh. So, Luke, Luke go on. Yeah, Luke, sorry, Luke. I know my mic's quiet and hard for me to get in, but, um, you know, you, you mentioned at one point early on, um, you know, kind of the KPIs, right, the key performance indicators for yeah. Daniel Levy. And uh, I think the, key, the KPIs are bringing revenue into the club, building up the value. Mm. So to your point about, you know, what happens if this rumored 11% hike on season tickets goes through okay that is going to upset quite a few people that's probably going to cause some people to write some percentage of current season ticket holders will choose not to renew yeah but there are probably people who will be happy for those folks to drop out because yeah. now they're moving up the queue Right, there is. I'm, yeah, I'm it's there's very good point. Ninety thousand that are on the point. waiting list, so of which I'm seventy-two thousand on the waiting list. 
you know, yeah, that's... Yeah, that's six, uh, about four years ago, I was 62,000. They contacted me to see I wanted a season ticket. Yeah, the, the, the list so, is misleading, and yeah. there's something odd on that. I have a, Luke has yeah. a point, though. Sorry, we, I think... A lot of people turn it down. What, yeah, yeah, Luke's quite quiet. So sorry, look, I talked over you there before you'd finished no your point. Go, go back. No worries. Um, I'm just saying, right, one person's bad fortune is somebody else's good yeah, fortune. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't think that you would see um, a lot of, of friction or a lot of difficulty there with getting in, you know, whatever percentage of season ticket holders aren't going to renew there yeah. will be people who are going to be happy to jump in and take their place. I and one. let's say there is no season ticket holder queue. Let's say the only people who want season tickets are the current holders right now. If ticket prices go up by 11% and only 2% of people don't renew, and now we've got 2% of the stadium sitting empty, I mean, you can do the math on this, right? Would you rather have 98% of your customers paying 11% more yeah. or 100% of your customers paying 0% more? Yeah, but Luke, that's a very much a – that's probably the way that um, Lee would look at it, very yeah. sort of um, spreadsheet way looking at it. But the optics of it, as, especially the way things are right now at the club, would yeah. be horrendous, wouldn't they? Um, yeah, and but I did do a quick back of, the, back of the beer map calculation, that 10%, 11%. Probably raised about four million, I think. Did yeah. I get that right? Or I missed out on zero, mm. but about four million quid, which is nothing to a club like Spurs. No. But, but all well, the it's bad no idea tipping and point for him to make a different decision, though, is it? I know a lot of people who said that they, if that went up by that amount, they would they'd throw it in. Yeah, definitely. Would they really? Yeah, I had a season yeah, ticket for I mean, twenty odd years until Potch got the sack. I went, nah, you know, not that's it, you know. And yeah, I'm glad yeah, I it's been turgid since then. But um, I never have a problem getting a ticket on the ticket exchange. Never. No, I don't yeah, I mean, either. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm and, a problem. A lot of my friends that. I said, look, if you, if you don't, I don't want to go to every match, you know. And that's what's going yeah. to happen, you know. If it's Sorry, easy Luke. to get a ticket on, on, on the ticket exchange, people will do that instead of getting a season ticket. Sorry, guys, Luke's, Luke's just trying to get a word in, but it's a bit my Sorry, Luke. Luke. Sorry, yeah, Sorry. Sorry, Luke, it's very hard to hear you. Sorry. Yeah, I know. It's I don't know why my mic doesn't work. It's so far away. No. <laughs> it's, it's right on my face. Like, my lips are against it right now. I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, to your point about, yes, you know, seeing it, you know, that 98% of the customers paying 11% more, you are absolutely right that that is a very cold calculation to make, right? It's not going to be pleasing to fans. It's not going to make us look good. Um, and I, I totally agree with you, right, as somebody who – you know, enjoys going to things every so often. I like it when they don't cost my whole paycheck. Um, but, you know, I, I think Levy's response to your points would be, right, his job is not necessarily to make people stay as in love with the club as they were when, you know, Mora hit the equalizer against Ajax, right? He, he's not going to, he, that's not his job is to keep everybody that happy all the time. And I think he would say as well, you know, to the point about the optics looking bad, I think Levy would say, great, how many midfielders can I buy for optics? Mm. You know, that's my, point, yeah, I think my, point, look, my point would be that the amount they're going to raise by raising that, it seems like it's by that amount, it's, it's trivial compared to... Yeah, the, this is... So I, I mean? agree, it's like... I say I, the I optics get, of it all, you know? Yeah. Like, Luke, you're it? spot on. I can't say, David. <clears throat> yeah. No, I agree with Luke in, in, in what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. But but for the amount of hassle it's you can see the press will be all over this and put the prices up. We've yeah. Had a on the way out. We've constantly just it, it just the whole thing. It would together. be Ooh. it would be it would be media suicide to do it. And I I don't think they yeah. like they must consider how this impacts like sales in terms of shirts and you know merchandise and fans who are well, very, like, it, my my feeling was them was always in the early days, and I don't think they changed. It. They're quite arrogant. They're quite arrogant. Mm, right. They all seem to know the best. I remember getting into discussion with them about when they wanted to issue a new shirt every season. And they and Levy said, well, kids buy a shirt every other week, don't they? You know, it's like well, that, you... you know. I said, not, not <laughs> in those days, it's about, I don't know, 50 quid a shirt or something. 
I said, yeah, but yeah. you're going to be four. That, that's way back, and of course now it's normal, isn't it? It's yeah. three shirts a season now, yeah. isn't it? Well, like, um, you can't... Is that a few guys? Well, you know, kids buy shirts anyway. What the hell, you know? Well, you've got to imagine yeah. from their perspective, right? They're a bunch of mates. They all know each other really well. They spent 30 million quid on something as a group that they could sell tomorrow for probably three, four billion yeah. quid. Yeah. Why? They must think they're God's greatest mm. gift in terms of when it comes to invest. They, why, why would they change their behavior? The they must feel untouchable. Mm. And this and is this... the point, Jim. And this is the point that we were touching on yesterday on, 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 the, on, the, on the pod yesterday is because what you've got is if you're looking at where you want to take an organization, you have to have a joint purpose. Levy's purpose is not the purpose of the fans. The purpose of the fans is to win shit, right? So to, to win Champions Leagues, to win the league, to win cups. It's not about making the profit. We'll sacrifice the profit for the success on the pitch. So where you have that, where it's disjointed is... Levy will be pushing the business side of it and has done an amazing job and look at where we are. I remember standing on that piss waterfall that was the shelf when I was growing up and you couldn't <laughs> move. Yeah, yeah. And it, like, the ammonia would make your eyes water at half time. <laughs> lovely days, lovely memories, but I wouldn't want to do that now. And but you were seeing great stuff on the pitch, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, well yeah. sometimes. Let's, go, yeah. Let's, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. go to the late 80s, maybe. Mid to late 80s, yeah. But my point is that no you haven't got an organization that is obsessed with a purpose you've got a you've got a ceo that wants to drive the business what you need to do is get a football inside where he gives the control to and says the, the what is the goal the goal is champions league success premier league success in the next 5 to 7 years and everybody in that arm of the organization is obsessed with getting there and levy says Whatever you need, you get for that time because that is the obsession of the whole organization. And we're prepared to take a loss over here in order to finance that because that is what we're about. And that's the DNA of the club. And that goes back to the symbols. It goes back to the history. And we, you can't overturn all of that by just saying we're going to be a great business because, you know what, Bill Nick existed, Danny Blanchflower existed, Glenn Hoddle existed. All of those great teams, those great players that made us what we are, existed. That's and so right, yeah. he doesn't get that. He, he doesn't, doesn't get the fact that even now oh. when I walk up those steps and I see that green grass, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I mean, you could, right, playing devil's advocate here, we could say in the 22 years that they've been in charge, we've been to 14 semis and finals. 14, yeah. one four. One, one cup. Now, do we blame that on Levy or do we blame that on the players on the pitch? So I think where you're getting to that, it, it's, the, it's almost the culture of the club, isn't it? it yeah. Just doing enough. Just doing enough to get a... Lower than a lower target than Liverpool or United yeah. or even Arsenal. There, sadly, that's it. I would agree. Reach. We're, we're, we're aiming a bit lower, and that's that's yeah. going to make the money. That's going to make the money. Yeah. It's, but and, right, and I don't blame I don't blame Levy necessarily for those individual mishaps on the pitch, the semi final. No, you can't. Lost. Be, oh, no, I can't. Can you? No, you just no. he can't. But, but we didn't put. But you know, what he funny at a ring back, did he? You know. He could absolutely be a figurehead and come out and, and, and within the organisation say, this oh, is... Busy. Yes, this is and that busy, is key, is Simon. David and Simon, you work in... We all do, right? We all work in large multinational organisations that are very successful. So we've seen what, how... And all those companies have a clear mission. It's like, here is the goal for every single employee to align to. Then you know we have a tough decision. There is to do. It, That's our mission yeah, but, statement, isn't it? But what even does that like? It's so vague and unfollowed, isn't? It? Like, I guess it's we we it's definitely followed. dare when it comes to building our club infrastructure. But I don't think we, <laughs> I don't think we it's dare build a stadium. Pitch, yeah, like they build the stadium, we went and they did it. Yeah, but it's, there's, you're, you're, there's you're, also the other side, say, which sorry, I'm sorry, you know, Kieran, oh, on. God, sorry. sorry, mate. Just let me put the Simon is that spot on. The, the culture comes from the, you say about the top being can't blame Levy for the stuff that goes on the pitch, but we can certainly blame him for what goes off on off the pitch, 100%. which leads on to the pitch, right? So the culture, yeah. which everybody's talking about at the moment, is rotten from the top. 
Yeah. There, there's, Levy's not a winner. He's not in there getting people's faces or that's what his son's CEO is doing. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And that's him. He's just quiet. He sits in the back. And they said at the moment he's hiding in a cupboard somewhere and in Lily White House. No, you can find it. It sounds like he's Stalin, just, doesn't it? When he's found out yeah. and betrayed by Hitler, yeah. he's just locked himself in a room with a bottle of whiskey he's, and he won't come yeah, out. That, that's <laughs> I don't think he understands the business he's in. He he's thinks he's in a different business. He's, he's, he's in the football business and he doesn't understand yeah. what that actually yeah. means. I he think he does. He's been in it 20 us. plus years. He doesn't know what it means to us as fans. You know, he might, he's dealing with agents, he's dealing with, you know, he, he knows yeah. the, probably the football business inside out, let's be honest. But he's not getting the big picture, is he? Um, no. How he changes that, with a, that, that, the fans would expect Bonner to throw loads of money at it, you know, which of course all the clubs are going to do now because they're won by nation states and what have you. How, where are we fitting in that now? We've got to be a nation state as well now. To be well, yeah, this is a, you know? a defence of Daniel Levy. How could he, the business model he built in the mm. world of football when he bought Tottenham, we would be, we would have a number of major trophies under us now and we would be the strongest partner, where, a football club when it comes to mm. financial fair play, yes. to take advantage of those rules, all those things. And the landscape has changed well, when people it, start yes. buying football clubs yeah. for other reasons well, and Walker, he can't actually. compete with that yeah. um but at the same time like this is where a devil's advocate right i get what you're saying he clearly isn't a football man he's paid some really poor decisions in the recent the last five years in particular and some good decisions before that we can't even define if the guy's a fan it doesn't really sound i don't really buy that he was a big supporter of top of hots before and like you said his goals are tied to revenue more revenue equals success for daniel over over a trophy mm -hmm. um but at the same time He's lost, the company has lost money for two seasons in a row. And that to him must be like a 3-0 defeat to Arsenal. Like we've made big losses for two seasons in a row. So would he take, is he taking those risks because he does care? Or is it because he wants to take those risks to elevate the club's brand and continue to well, wants, you know, grow revenues in the long term? He wants it to be a worldwide um, entity, doesn't he? He wants to be selling shirts in South Korea and you know, probably buy a Japanese player next to, you know. That's what he, he wants to do. Luke will probably tell you that um, uh, in terms of the um, what looking at the, the, the spreadsheets and things, the key, the big thing the, the fans have got the power over Levy about is turning up at that stadium. He has to fill that is the big elephant in the room in a, in a funny sort of way. If he doesn't fill that stadium, his whole plan falls apart. His whole plan falls apart. Yeah. And that's the only power fans have got. March with their feet, you know. Arsenal did it five, six years ago. You saw that stadium half full for my son matches. And the message got through to the uh, the Cronkies, you know. That so the only the way only to... But the only way to force change is then to compete, thousands, convince thousands of people to forgo their tickets without listing them on the exchange, so to swallow money themselves. So Daniel has to swallow that money as well. And how do you do that? When you're fourth in the league, and we're yes, this, big yes, off. yes, because that's what you will see. That's what we'll say. We're fourth in the league. If we beat Southampton, <laughs> we went third, and no, we're this yeah. pissed off. Yeah, I mean, I, he, must, he must be. Uh, he must be scratching his head. Yeah. For Christ's sake, he I'm fuming, and I'm still going to go to every game this season. I don't yeah. care. It could be pissing of rain, and it's against mm. Stoke. On a I'm Tuesday so night, pissed off, but I still fly from Switzerland every other week to see. And them. that's why Daniel and has us snookered yes. every yes. time. There's got short and curly, yeah. Well, well, you watch, as you I said, Arsenal, Scott. You actually talked about Arsenal. Well, they actually how? did stop going to the stadium. Yeah, they did. Mm. They did. How? Yeah. How, but they still I don't know how you. Percy. Sorry, Luke. Sorry, Luke. I'm not sure how we. I'm not sure how you can say that you know Levy has snookered us or or has us on a string when we are pissed off that we're sitting fourth. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is a victim remember? of his own I success. I distinctly <laughs> remember when Crouch, Peter Crouch, hit that header off the corner against Man City yes. to cement our place yes. in fourth, right? Just as we, even as we'd kind of been making fun of Arsene Wenger for saying fourth is a trophy, when we finally got fourth, it is. <laughs> my God, that felt like a trophy. Nirvana. That is true, but Sai, you're a leader in culture now. and change and motivation, but you know that 
money isn't motivation it's it's no. growth and moving forward is is a big motivator and we're a victim of our own success we want more like we don't want to settle you always want more H- human nature is you want more oh yeah Look, i remember what you want you want the next thing so you would this will make yeah, you right. happy you're right. and then when i get it it will be the next thing that makes me happy and then the next thing and then the next thing do you guys remember when we qualified for the Intertoto Cup through the Fair Pay League? We were like, we won the... Uh, that was great. That was like winning the cup. Daily Mail who broke the news, like, oh my yeah. God, we could qualify for the least yellow cards. Well, that was like winning the Cup Bent, in David you Bentley, know, I mean... We were like, you know, working out the points. For, you know, we mustn't get another book in next Saturday. Or that was like winning a cup. Now look at us. We're fourth every, you know, like... No. Well, I think six out of the last eight years or something. Yeah, and then that's not good yeah. enough for people now, is it? Because well, I think no. the Arsenal up the road are doing so well. That's but I think the also problem, I think. the point is that we we didn't kick on from when we were when we when we got to those that pinnacle of the of the UCL the, the Champions League final. We didn't we didn't kick on because we'd underinvested the season before. That yeah. papered over so many cracks. The, the back end that, of that though, season was awful. Sorry, yeah, the, the the season we left White Hart Lane. Yeah. I reckon if we had another season in White Hart Lane, we might want to won the, the Premier League. That oh, Premier it's, yeah. I'll, I'll even call it now. If, if we had no. Poch's, Poch's peak team now, we'd win the league. I think yeah. we are better than that Arsenal team. The now. timing was so bad for us, really. It was just a real shame. Yeah, yeah. But, and I, I know, too, but you're right. That's when you sorry, see what Arsenal are doing now. Arsenal doing it now. They're investing now. They're just investing yeah. a big... Yeah. Well, we you're right, David. Yeah, you know, they yeah, they got right. to that Pochettino point, and they keep adding a hundred million. They keep adding on. Yeah, that's where we Sorry, went Luke. On. Yeah. Well, no, Sorry, I, and are you I saying think, something? I, I do think that um, you know we always kind of have to remember that we have the benefit of hindsight, right? We can look back at you know that season when everyone fell apart and Leicester was kind of standing with the last club standing at the top of the heap, yeah. right? Um, you know. Think about this as a thought experiment, though. If we had changed none of the results, right, changed absolutely none of our league results that season, but let's say we had gone ahead and won the League Cup or the FA Cup, if you want something slightly more prestigious, right? If we had won the League Cup or the FA Cup and finished third in that season when the league was very much there for the taking, I think there would be a still a sizable number of our supporters who would say, Oh, well, yeah, the FA cup was great, but we should have won the league. You're right. You're right. Luke. Levy's fault somehow. Right. And I I think it's a 10 pot cup, Luke, you know, yeah. Right. Until, that, you know, yeah. It's not enough to appease the, the tr- and we, we've been worn down right by being the media joke and it doesn't matter that Chelsea are under FFP investigations, Man City are under, like Man City have been, have done far worse things and the media should be much more scrutiny, uh, much more scrutiny on Chelsea and Man City than they do Tottenham who have challenged them. In an but why are we way. getting this? I don't understand why we are getting this Spursy nonsense. We haven't won something all the time. We haven't won something since 2008. All the time. We're talking. Okay, what about Newcastle, Everton, uh, Madison Villa? Uh, similar to us. Well, isn't it, isn't it, Newcastle won a thing for 50-odd years, have they? Isn't it yes, 92% no, of trophies in the last 10 years in England yes. run by the same four clubs or something? Yes. Like, and, yes. and three of those clubs are Man City, Chelsea and Man United, who we yep. cannot financially compete with in any way, and Liverpool, who we can't compete with. Draw yeah, at all, either. Exactly. Prior to Abramovich turning up, Chelsea had won six trophies in their entire history. In their yeah. entire history, they yeah. since won about twenty odd, haven't they? So it's no doubt if we 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 win about three a season since the sixties on average. So I'm no doubt if Chelsea, Man City haven't turned up, we'd have, we'd have maintained that sort of average. Do you understand? Yeah, it's all right when, you, when you can write off ninety million a year as well without even yeah. blinking. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Uh, but we need to yeah. wrap up there, lads, because it's been over an hour. But I've I've loved the chat, and I just want to kind of summarise what we've been through. Because like the the concept was to give people a bit more of a view of like, are Enoch what are Enoch in association with the club, and how much, sh- like how do we force change, and how much influence do they have, and are they ever going to go anywhere? But what we've established is they're not going anywhere. 
everything is going in an upward trajectory for them. They, they see this as a 30 million pound investment they've turned into nearly a 4 billion pound investment and it's only going up. So they're not cashing out. Levy has a huge amount of control. He's probably not going anywhere either anytime soon. So all you can really try and force at the moment is for him to step the hell away from football and keep his hands off the football decisions in the club. If you're asking for something to change, they aren't hiding money away from the club from what we can see looking at the balance sheets, right? They're not funneling money into offshore accounts and um, uh, yeah, doing to. dodgy yeah. things with it. They don't need to, exactly. But <laughs> He's doing rather well all on his own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Equally, they don't sit on billions of pounds of cash they can pump into the club. But right. they yeah. clearly don't know how to take us from fourth to first. And I, I, that's a fair thing to be frustrated about. But equally, the job they did getting us from 14th to 4th was a, was a good achievement. Yeah. They deserve some, yeah. some credit yeah. for that. It was, it was an amazing achievement, actually, in many ways. It's been growth. If you honest. compare the clubs that weren't bankrolled, we're the only ones to achieve anywhere near that level of, that level of growth from those clubs that are around us at the time. Levy probably isn't a Tottenham supporter. We have no evidence he is. Just himself I telling think he is. to go to games. He is. Well, he might be. Okay. But it's, it's speculative. But what we're saying is we have no evidence. Well, you would be, was. Yeah, I'm not the club, you? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, okay. But his priority, I think, with establishing this is revenue sure. growth over trophies. And right. that, I understand, is a completely fair thing to get very frustrated about as, as a, a Should we finish on a, a note of optimism here? Yeah, go on. There is a certain person in the whole thing we've not mentioned, and that is Joe Lewis's daughter who is his only daughter, and she's going to inherit the trust. So probably sooner rather than later, it's not wishing anything bad to happen for all Joe, she will probably be the major shareholder in Tottenham in the next three to four years. And her attitude might be very different. You know, right. her attitude might be, I don't want this, I don't want a football club in my portfolio. Or she might think, well, we can go better than this and I'm going to release more funds. So... If that you is know, what, she likes I mean, football, she's, David. She's been at the ground, hasn't she? She's been spotted at the ground. Um, there was a rumour going around that she didn't like Lee very, very much, but I'm not sure if that's true or not. But um, that that can go either way. Either she wants to die best from the club, in which case they, she's got, they've got enough shares to sell, sell off their junk of it, or she gets more involved in it. So yeah. and then, it could either way, you know. Do you want the devil you know or the devil to come? Well, there you are. Yeah, exactly. But we're, are we saying people, the voice of optimism, David, for, yeah. is that Daniel's never going anywhere, but the other majority shareholder might die soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, <laughs> it's not a hint of optimism from Mr. Lewis, is it? But, uh, <laughs> it's inevitable, isn't it? It comes to us all, as they say. Yeah, but yeah. There's yeah. no pockets in the shroud, as they say. Yeah, no, but, but on a serious note, I wish um, Joe Lewis all the, way, all the best, and like, best, yeah, I've yeah, never yeah, wished death on anyone. He's a, he's a, he's done a great things for our football. Lovely old chap. Look at where we were 20 years yeah. ago, and nothing against you, Joe. That was just a even, even if, even if they did sell off, you know that Levy wants to stay there. He can part the deal if they sell. Levy wants to keep the job as CEO, right? Yeah. So the yeah. only hope we can have is that somebody uh, whoever does come in, hopefully one day, if Lewis does sell up, Miss, Miss Lewis sells up, is that more, you know more money gets pumped in. You know that's what we can mm. hope. Isn't it? I think that that's the big hope. Rather than some some company coming and taking or, or some nation state coming and taking over, which I don't think will happen. I think what might happen is the, the, the Lewises might might bail out eventually, relinquish their control to someone else. Yeah. yeah. That's well, the future. It was a really good pod, guys, yeah, and I'm going to shut it down. But thank you, Luke, Sai, and David. That was super interesting. Sorry, I'm Luke, gonna, did you uh, get a look in there, did you? Sorry? Sorry. <laughs> Apologies to yeah, Luke. Well. That's when we could see you trying to interject all the time. It would be better.